self-righteousness, yet there is a gulf between self-righteousness and true godliness, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by the works of the law. The works of the law may be deep, may be high, may be broad. The works of the law may be many. You might multiply them and you can refer to them. You might keep a diary of what you do, of the works of the law, the works of the law. I gave that, I did that, I said that, I endeavored to do that. No man can be justified by the works of the law. But by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That's the real godliness there. And that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Not by the works of the law. It says, because for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. By the works of the law, obedience to the law, and then keeping even the moral law, the, sea, the ceremonial law, and the civil law, every kind of law, by your trial, by yourself, no one can be justified. And there is a gulf between the self-righteous and the one who is truly godly. Look at Philippians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 6. Philippians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 6. Here is Saul, when he was Saul, self-righteous. Here is Saul, Saul, when by the works of the law, he thought it was all right. He could even claim perfection. But now he shows us all that perfection of the natural man, all that morality of the natural man. Their works of the law and they cannot justify anyone. Philippians chapter 3 verse 6 concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That is who he was, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't born again. His name was not written in the book of life. He could tell anyone anywhere as to the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless, perfect, spotless. But look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ. When I met Christ, I saw, I discovered that all those things I bragged about, all those things I was proud of, they were nothing. And so I had to count them lost for Christ. Verse 8, in verse 8 it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ he said I have to give up that one I have to give up the self-righteousness before I could have the Savior's righteousness. I had to give up the righteousness that I produce by my human effort so that I would have the righteousness that Christ himself alone has purchased. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And be found in him not having my own righteousness. And be found in him not having, not bragging, and not testifying about my own righteousness, self-righteousness. Even after we are born again, if you go back to, you know, the fact that actually I'm born again now, I thank God, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but really, but really, look at my life. I never, never smoked in my life. I never drank in my life. I never did this. I never did that. And you are rejoicing in that and you minimize the righteousness of Christ. 
and you minimize the righteousness that came to you that was given to you by grace and as a gift then you are back to the old self Paul the apostle said and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith look at number three here number three we're looking at the goal for the self-righteous without grace the goal the bitterness that is for the one who is self-righteous without the grace of God in Galatians chapter 2 verse 17 Galatians 2 17 but if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves also are found sinners is therefore Christ the minister of sin God forbid he said I was trying to justify ourselves actually it was uh, referring to what Peter the apostle had just done he was uh, eating with the Gentiles uh, before the Jews from Jerusalem came because he believed and he knew that Jew or Gentile Peter or any of those people in Antioch is by grace were saved it's not because you are a Jew that you are saved it's not because you are is a Gentile that is not saved by the same grace by the same love of God and by the same sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary we are both saved but then when those Jews came from Jerusalem and he saw them he thought they might question me why I'm eating with the Gentiles you know why he thought and they thought the salvation of the Jews who are circumcised that salvation is up there and then the salvation of the Gentiles who are not circumcised that salvation is down below there and he, saw, he felt that the Jews in their salvation even though it is by Christ that the Jews are higher than the Gentiles who are born again and so he let those people he was eating with and then Paul the apostle said Peter if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves also are found sinners hypocrites pretenders and we are not following after the truth the truth of the grace of God is there therefore Christ the minister of sin what was saying is what you have done in hypocrisy that is sin what you have done is separating yourself from the Gentiles that is sin but now you are born again Christ lives in you was it Christ that made you to be hypocritical? Was it Christ that made you to withdraw yourself like that? Is Christ then the minister, the originator of sin? Will you say, Peter, that what you've done now, which is sin, would you say that is the product of Christ? Christ made me do that. He didn't allow any answer. He said, God forbid. God cannot be the originator of sin. Christ cannot be the originator of sin. He came to take our sin away. And so, Peter, what you've done was not right. There's the goal of self righteousness without grace. He's saying, Don't you know what happens to the people? Who will not remain on Christ and Christ alone. Acts chapter 8. Reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 8 verse 19. Saying, give me also this power. That on whomsoever I lay hands. He may receive the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. In verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. What's happening here? The apostles had come from Jerusalem, Peter and John. 
And these people who knew the Lord and believed in the Lord in Samaria, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Understand? Salvation by grace. Sanctification by grace. Holy Ghost power by grace. But he had done work. The work of his labor. The labor of his son. And the labor of his son, and the work of his son, had given him, gotten him money. <clears throat> and then he now said, by my labor, I got money. By my works, I got money. And the result of my labor, here is the money. Give me this power. As I give you this money, that's why Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast taught that the gift of God, there we are, salvation gift, sanctification gift, Holy Ghost baptism gift, and this man wanted to buy the gift of God with money. You have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Look at verse 23 there. Verse 23, I perceive that thou art in the goal of bitterness. Thou art in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Anyone that tries to buy salvation by the works of his hand, anyone that wants to get to heaven by the works of his hand, anyone that uh, ought to think in, he is going to have reconciliation with God by the works of the law. He is in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. But we don't have to go that direction. Salvation is free. Salvation is a gift. And the Lord has said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, a Jew or a Gentile, whosoever believeth in him, that's all you need to do. You come, you forget all your works, and you forget all your labor, and you forget all your self-righteousness, and you come to the Lord. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You will not perish. You have everlasting life. As you come, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross, I clinch, because my tears forever flow, and my zeal no respite, no. All these for sin cannot atone, thou, and thou alone must save. And I pray the salvation of God will be ours in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, the lostness of compromisers judged for their falsehood. We're coming to Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What does that mean? In application to, you know, the situation on hand there, Peter had gone in an earlier chapter of, uh, of Acts of the Apostles, he had gone to the gentle house Cornelius. He stayed with them. He ate with them. He slept in the rooms they provided him. And he preached the word of God to him. And while he was speaking, the Holy Ghost came on all those that had him. And Peter himself said, can anyone forbid water that this should not be baptized in water, seeing that they have received the same gift of the Holy Ghost as we? And then in the following chapter, he had said, For we believe that they will be saved, even as us, the Jews. He had broken down, he had destroyed the ideology of Judaism, as if Judaism or the obedience to the Mosaic law will save anyone. He destroyed that. And he said, by faith, faith in Christ, are we saved? Now, Paul the Apostle said, Peter, you know what you're doing now? By withdrawing from preaching with those Gentiles, you're building again the things 
which you once destroyed. And he said, I make myself a transgressor. If I did that, look at verse 19. In verse 19, for I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. He says, it's her faith in Christ. It's the connection with Christ. It's putting our trust totally in Christ that saves us. And we know that whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, faith in Christ will reconcile you to God. Christ brings you to God. But now, if we forget that and we build again the law, the law of Moses, and we build again confidence in the law. Moses, we build what we destroyed before. Then we make ourselves transgressors. The lostness of compromisers judged for their falsehood. Three things there. Number one, inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism. Legal, the law, legalism. That's the law, the Jewish system of being reconciled to God. The inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism. Number two, incorrigible teachers who breed lawlessness and lasciviousness. The incorrigible teachers, they have heard, they have known that Christ and Christ alone is the Savior. And now, but they're incorrigible. And they keep on that wrong way and that wrong path of the Mosaic law. Number three, incoherent tricksters. It's like they're playing games. It's like they're playing tricks. And they are incoherent. They cannot even understand themselves. They do things they cannot match with what they actually believe, they are split personalities. They act this way, they think another way. They go this way, but then their direction in their mind is another direction. They think about Christ and they're thinking of the law. They think about salvation and the justification by faith in Christ, but their works and their activity is like upholding and raising up the law of Moses again. They are not coherent, incoherent tricksters who be, who be cloud is love. They be cloud is love that the people they are speaking to cannot see very clearly. The law of God anymore because they are incoherent. Let's come to number one. Number one, inconsistent transgressors who build on legalism. We're looking at Acts chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 11. Acts 15 verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. You find in that verse, we, who are the we? The Jews, they were in a meeting together, council together, conference together. They were considering the salvation and the conversion of the Gentiles. And they were all Jews there that they referred to the Gentiles, the Gentiles who have been saved through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, and they came to report to them, here is what had happened. And then they concluded, they said, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we Jews shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles, let's look at a verse. We're looking at verse 19 there. In verse 19, wherefore, my sentence is this, that we trouble not them, that we Jews, Jewish believers, trouble not them, the Gentiles, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. They didn't have circumcision, but they turned to God. They didn't have all those uh, offerings of the, of the Jewish people, but they turned to God. They didn't obey all those mosaic laws, but they have turned to God. Let's not trouble them. Let's understand it's Calvary. Let's understand it's Christ that brings salvation from among the Gentiles. They are turned to God. And then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20, it says, but that we write unto them. 
that they abstain from the pollution of idols now that one we need to tell them now they are saved by grace and now they have their love their allegiance to god and god alone that they turn from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood look at verse 28 in verse 28 for it seemed good to the holy ghost it seemed good to the holy ghost it's not because of moses now it's not because of the law of, law of moses the holy ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things in verse 29 that ye abstain from meats offered to idols so that your love is wholeheartedly given to God and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well ye shall do well fear ye well let's come to number two there number two there we're looking at incorrigible teachers who breach lawlessness and lascivious sins after all that had been settled no one should go back again to the law of Moses. No one should confuse anyone anymore with, uh, you know, the law of Moses and go back to Leviticus each day and don't eat that and go back to Deuteronomy. Here is what you have to do, the statutes and the laws and everything. Nobody should have gone back to that anymore. But there were teachers that were incorrigible it's just like somebody has been going to a particular religion before a particular denomination before a particular traditional church before and now he comes out of there and he claims to be born again he claims to be for christ and he claims that it is the grace of christ that has brought him into the kingdom but now he practices the religion, the tradition that he left behind, incorrigible. That although he says, I'm born again by faith in Christ, the practices of that old religion is what he still continues in. And there are some taboos, and there are some don'ts, and there are some things. Never, 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 I can never do that. Why? Is that because of the truth in Christ? Because of the grace of God? Uh-uh. Where I'm coming from, we never did that there. That's what the Lord is saying, that they are incorrigible teachers who breach lawlessness and lasciviousness. We're looking at Galatians uh, chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh and manifest now there are those who confuse the works of the law and the works of the flesh they don't understand anytime you see works 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 they say works of the law works of the law look at this one this one the works of the flesh as we become born again you become a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so the works of the flesh, not works of the law, the works of the flesh that will still try to rear up its ugly head, you understand? You will not get involved with that. You will not say works of the law, works of the flesh, works of doing good and works of this, everything lumped together. I am not there. Look at this now. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, that's uncleanness, that's chibiousness. Then in verse 20, it says, idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and variance, simulations, raw strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, it says, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, 
of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, now we're justified by Christ, and we come to the Lord, we get his sin, we reject, we push away from our lives the works of the law. All those works of the law, the law of Moses, all that we deny, all that we separate from, but we will not indulge in the works of the flesh because anyone indulging in the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. I will inherit the kingdom of God. The Lord confirm it in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two here. Number, two, uh, number, number three, rather. We're looking at number three. The incoherent tri 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 tricksters who becloud his love. There are people who are incoherent. There are people who contradict themselves. There are people who are not straightforward. And you cannot make them walk in the straight path. You listen to them one day, and then you listen to them another day. You say, preacher, you're contradicting yourself. Preacher, you don't even understand what you're saying. They are incoherent. Now, we must not confuse the works of the law and the word of the Lord after we're born again. Look at it this way. Here is the man. Here is the past. Here is the future. All that he did in the past will not earn him salvation. We don't earn salvation. The good things you did in the past, the bad things you did in the past, will not hinder you getting saved when you put your faith in Christ. After putting your faith in Christ, the life that follows after that. You will not live that life in lawlessness, in evil, because you are now saved. Your works will not save you. Good works will not save you. But when you are saved, salvation will lead you to good works. Look at this now. Jude chapter 1. We're looking at verse 4. Jude 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained pre reaching to this condemnation on godly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. You know, there are people that will say, Good works don't matter. Righteous life doesn't matter. Sanctification doesn't matter. New nature doesn't matter. When you are saved, you can continue whatever you did. The Bible doesn't say that. It's saying your good works before you are saved cannot save you. But when you are saved, good works will come. Righteous life will come. There's no confusion. But there are certain men crept in on unawares who before were ordained unto this condemnation on godly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray there will be no confusion in your profession of faith in Jesus' name. Look at Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. You are a Jew, circumcised. You are a Gentile, not circumcised. All that does not matter. You have come to Christ, and as you have come to Christ, circumcision availeth nothing. On circumcision availeth nothing, but faith that walketh by love. Faith that walketh by love. A faith in Christ. 
makes us to have love for God and love for one another. And the love now will reveal itself by the actions we have. Look at verse 13 there. In verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the, to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That, that's not the law of Moses. This one is the love of God in our heart that by faith, by love, we serve one another. I pray that this new life of the real believer in Christ will be produced in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. Point number three now, our life in Christ after justification by faith. Our life in Christ after justification by faith. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. It says, I've abandoned Moses. I've abandoned the law of Moses. I've abandoned all the old covenant injunctions. But now I'm totally with Christ, identified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the love of Christ that has saved me, not the works of the law, he gave himself for me is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that brought the justification, the reconciliation, the redemption, and the righteousness. It's not the law of Moses. It says he gave himself for me. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, I do not prostrate the grace of God. I do not prostrate the grace of God. Those who claim they have the grace of God and they live in their new life as the old life. No change, no transformation. They prostrate the grace of God. Those who claim to have the grace of God and they live a worse life than the criminals who have never tasted of the grace of God they prostrate the grace of God. Those who say they have the grace of God and they say, I can do anything I want to do. I can yield to the flesh. I can allow the flesh to control me. I can allow Satan to control me because I am saved. I am saved. I have the grace of God. That grace of God is doing nothing in their life. They frustrate the grace of God. And those who say, I have the grace of God, but I leave the grace of God behind. I will have righteousness by my own strength. I don't have to pray. I don't have to lean upon the Lord. I don't have to confide in the Lord. I don't have to hope in the Lord by myself. I have grace, but I'm not going to make use of that grace. For if righteousness come by the law, by self-effort, by self-endeavor, then... Christ is dead in vain. I pray that in your life, in my life, the Lord will not die in vain in Jesus' name. Let's look at this now. Our life in Christ after justification by faith. Three things. Number one, the crucified life of believers in Christ. The crucified life of believers in Christ. Number two, the consecrated lifestyle or behavior like Christ, like that of Christ. And then number three, the consistent leaning of believers on Christ. Look at number one. Number one is the crucified life of believers in Christ. 
come to that Galatians again, chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. You need to have personal experience. And you need to know the time, the date, when you came to Christ. And in your free volition, you surrender to Christ in a very definite way for a definite experience that you identify with Christ. You might be kneeling down. You might be standing up. Whatever your bodily posture, but you know and you remember that you came to Christ for this definite experience of real conversion. Crucified. Dead with Christ. Buried with Christ. And then there's a new life. You rose with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Not we are crucified with Christ. Personal identification with Christ. As an individual, you came to Christ in a definite way. And you can say, I know the day. I know the time. I know the hour. I know the place. And I know the condition of my heart. And I fully surrendered unto Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Paul, what are you saying? Are you not confusing us? No, not at all. The physical crucifixion will make him die. But this one is not physical crucifixion. This is spiritual crucifixion. This is from the heart of the man, the heart of the woman, the heart of the believer that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is no physical crucifixion. It is a spiritual experience. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Yet not I. I don't live by struggling anymore. I don't live by sleeping on hard ground anymore. I don't live by walking on pebbles anymore. I don't live by punishing myself anymore. Thinking, if I punish my flesh, if I punish myself, if I deny myself for sleep, if I deny myself for food, then I'll live the righteous. He said, no, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. It's resurrection. It's not just that he rose from the dead, that living Christ, that reigning Christ, he reigns in me. He reigns in my heart. He reigns in my character. He reigns in my behavior. Reign, Master Jesus, reign. Reign, Master Jesus, reign over every act, over every action, over my behavior, over my identity over my opinion over the old life reign he says but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live not the life of the past not the life under the law not the life under self-righteousness the new life the redeemed life the righteous life the ransomed life the life that is reconciled unto God. It says the life which I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the new life of the believer. We are passed away from the time of the law. Now we come to the Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer a sanctifier and now because he lives inside us he produces the life of christ and the life of righteousness in us we're looking at romans chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 6 romans chapter 6 verse 6 knowing this that our old man is crucified the old man depraved man deceptive man deceptive nature in us that old man old character old habit old nature it says our old man is crucified with him 
is made impotent, invalid. It's made powerless. That old man, the life we used to live, the character of the past, the habit of the past, that old nature is crucified and made impotent and powerless. It says that the body of sin, the total root of sin, and the one that generates and produces sin, that the body of sin might be destroyed, not suppressed, destroyed, not managed, destroyed, not enlightened, destroyed, not controlled, destroyed. The life of the old man, the lust of the old man, the anger of the old man, and the fretting of the old man is not just to come under control, just to be subdued. It's not to be submerged within or under many of many other things that you know was you try to you grit your teeth when that anger comes and you are boiling on the inside and then you quickly run away from that place so that you will um, you will go to a place nobody will see and the psychologist might tell you let that anger come and then go somewhere and Picture somebody in front of you as if that is the person that is causing the anger and every bad thing you wanted to say to that man, don't say that in the public, that will destroy your success, that can take your business away from you, that can put you in a class that you lose a lot of things, but go in the secret and punch that air and punch that person as if you are fighting a personality. That one is psychology. That one doesn't work. The anger is still there like a tiger, like a tyrant, like a lion. But when you come to Christ and you stretch yourself on the cross of Christ and you're crucified and you can say, I am crucified with Christ. And the old man is crucified and the body of sin destroyed that henceforth we shall not serve sin you will not serve sin clean and clear that the grace of god in our lives will bring the new life in our lives will totally be new look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says for he that is dead who is that crucified with christ dead with christ he that is dead is freed from sin. I am free. You believe that? I am free. The Lord confirmed that in your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two there. Number two, the consecrated lifestyle or behavior like Christ. Like Christ. What Christ will do. What Christ will say. How Christ will feel, how Christ will act, that your consecration, your devotion now is to live the life that Christ will live if Christ were here today. Now, when we say living like Christ, you have to think like Christ because it's our thought that brings our emotion. If something is happening uh, and you look at it, you focus on it, you don't focus at what you have, the grace you have, the goodness of God and the provision of God, you focus on that thing, uh, that focus will bring feeling. And then, if that thing is a bad thing, and you focus on it, and you're thinking about that, your thoughts and your focus will bring a feeling of, it may be a feeling of rejection, a feeling of depression, a feeling of anger, a feeling of worry and anxiety because you have a wrong focus, a wrong feeling. And because of that, the way you feel is how you are now act. If somebody did something and you concentrate on that and you don't know who you are, a child of the king. 
a follower of Jesus Christ. A person that has Christ living on the inside of him. And you are to live like Christ. If you don't think like that, and you have the thoughts the other way, then action will come. And when you take an action that is wrong, an action that is wrong, another action that is wrong, it's like you're walking a particular path on a grass field. After you walk there, up and down, a long time, you'll make a path on that grass field, and naturally, anyone coming, you just walk on that automatically. When you concentrate on the wrong thing, on the wrong feeling, on the wrong emotion, on the wrong act, and you act like that every time, it becomes your personality your personality even without anything to be angry about you get angry nothing to be furious about you get furious nothing to you know shout about be worried about you get furious and you shout and you're worried and you're frightened but now when you come to Christ and you know that all that matters is what Christ will do how Christ will think you have the thoughts of Christ you have the mind of Christ, you have the way of Christ, you have the behavior of Christ, you have the lifestyle of Christ, and you are thinking of Christ, Christ every, every time that lives in you. It makes your life, what your behavior, what your lifestyle ought to be, it will happen. It has happened already. That the life of Christ will be reproduced in your life in Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. We don't have time uh, for me to take you through, uh, you know, the way it ought to be. Uh, the way it ought to be is this. When you read that sentence, you emphasize the I. Whatever is happening around you, you say, I, I. I, so and so you mention your name, I am, then you emphasize the am, I am, then you emphasize the crucified, 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 old nature, crucified, the way I used to act, crucified, and the way I used to behave, crucified, and then with Christ, with Christ, you emphasize with Christ. And then later, you read everything together. I am crucified with Christ. Anything happening around you, you remind yourself, I am crucified with Christ. I used to behave like that. I used to think like that. I used to talk in that other way. But now, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The life I live now is exciting. The life I live now is productive because nevertheless I live and yet not I. I couldn't do this by myself. I couldn't act like this by myself. There is a power greater than my natural power. There is a power greater than my normal self that lives big in me now but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, in the flesh, marriage flesh, in the flesh, bachelor's flesh, in the flesh, sweetest flesh, in the flesh, the life I now live on earth, no matter my situation, marriage or not marriage, job or no job, Christ is always happy, I'm happy. Christ is excited. I'm excited. Christ is purposeful. I'm purposeful. Christ is on top of the stormy sea. I'm on top of the stormy sea because the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Somebody else may doubt the love of God. He loves me. And what I'm going through, some people might say, if you're going through that, maybe God does not love you anymore. He loves me. Why? Love me enough to give himself for me. I pray this will be reproduced in every life in Jesus' name. And then you live like he would have been living if he were here right now. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were ye called. Even here unto were ye called. I am called to salvation. 
I'm called by the Savior and I'm called to live like the Savior because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye shall follow his test. Ye shall follow his test. What does that mean? I look at the life of Jesus and I look at the way and the place he places is uh, is is tears. and then i see that step and whatever is happening now i say what will christ do in this condition in this situation how will he think how will he talk how will he live and how will he interact that ye should follow his steps. I pray you'll follow his steps. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that was in Christ Jesus. Now, you're saved by grace and you come to God by grace. By, by grace and you are inch with Christ by grace now it's not just that I believe in the head I believe in the heart and now I have the mind of Christ the mind of Christ whatever we're hearing in the current affairs the mind of Christ whatever may be happening in economy ecology I have the mind of Christ. Whatever may be up or down, down or up, and whatever storm there may be, the mind of Christ. The mind that knows that whatever the Father has ordained, that is what will happen. And so we are not jolted, and we are not surprised, and we are not uh, dispressed or discouraged because we have the mind of Christ. And that is what the new life and the new experience, that is what it does in our lives. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then we're looking at First John chapter 2 verse 6. First John chapter 2 verse 6. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought also so to walk, so to talk, so to think, so to behave, so to act, as Christ, as he himself also was. He that says, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as Christ walked. Amen? Amen. Look up here. There are times in our lives when things happen, we have the knowledge in our head that whatever happens, I should live like Christ. The grace is there. The Christ is there. He lives on the inside of you. But when something happens, we have an automatic way of responding, of reacting. We never consult Christ. We never think of Christ. We're too fast in reacting. We're too fast in responding. And when you are like that, the old reaction, the old action, the old feeling is what will pop up every time. You have not even, you know, called for that, but that's what will happen. But if you can slow down, something happened like it always happens. And the normal, regular, habitual thing will try to pop up, say, hold on, slow down, I'm in charge. Because you have to be in charge of your life. You have to be in charge of your action. You have to be in charge of your new life. And then you say, Christ, I thank you because you live in me. You abide in me. Look at my situation here, Christ. If you were here, how will you act? How will you talk? Slow down. If you don't slow down, the old attitude, old action, old behavior will come up again. But when you slow down and you ask the Lord, what shall I do at this time? How shall I respond at this time? What direction shall I go at this time? He that says, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked your walk victoriously.
your life will take on a new approach a new excitement a new victory in jesus name number three here in number three we have the consistent leaning of believers on christ look at the galatians chapter 2 verse 21 i do not frustrate the grace of god i do not frustrate the grace of god look up here let's say you have you'll never be sick i didn't hear your amen yeah. but for illustration let's say you have sickness and then uh, somebody who loves you spoke to a doctor and this doctor is the number one expert in the land sends him to you and he says i'd like to have this challenge i'm here to make you overcome the challenge and you neglect him you don't answer him how do you feel no answer what are you going through no answer set out your tongue let me see the condition on your tongue no response he'll be frustrated because he has the help he has the support he has the knowledge he can make you well in every way in every area of your life but you don't respond to him he will be frustrated until he has to leave now the grace of god is there with us all the time by grace he has saved by grace you are sanctified by grace you are strengthened by grace you are succored the grace of god is available to make you the newest kind of creature you can be and the most successful and righteous that you can be but the grace is frustrated because you never appeal to that grace you never ask for more grace you never depend on that grace you never lean on that grace it's frustrated that's why paul the apostle said by the grace of god i am what i am i go through that challenge the grace is there i come through that persecution the grace is there i come through that misunderstanding the grace of god is there i come through that problem the grace of god by the grace of god i am what i am and the grace of god that was given to me was not in vain because he did not frustrate the grace of god from today you will not frustrate the grace of god he says i do not frustrate the grace of god for if righteousness came by law then christ is dead in vain. what he's saying is i know that righteousness will not come by the law i was very familiar with the law i was very familiar with the law of moses but now i've abandoned that i've thrown away that because grace has come in place and i always rely on that grace of god and as we rely more from tonight on the grace of god your life will be victorious your life will be righteous and your life will take on a new beauty spiritually in jesus name grace amazing grace grace that is greater than all our sins and that grace available for you tonight you can come to the throne of grace and require help at the time of need and grace will become abundant in your life in my life in my life grace abundant in jesus name rise up and tell the lord and let that grace do its work in your life do not frustrate the grace of god the grace of god will see you through whatever you are going through the grace of god will perfect everything concerning you in jesus name